Hi everyone, this is Anastasia Gors from PilatesBridge.com and today I'm super excited to share an interview and this uh, recording with you because I'm talking to Erin Myers and she is the owner of Spiral Spine in Nashville, Tennessee. But even more uh, exciting for us, she is uh, one of the researchers and teachers who really specializes in scoliosis. So this is something that we're going to be talking about. Uh, to her today, and she's the author of several books, several different courses and trainings, exciting stuff. I know a lot of you guys have questions, so I'll let Erin introduce herself just a little bit, just talk a little bit about herself, and then we'll um, start with our questions. Perfect. So I'm Erin, um, and uh, I have scoliosis. I was diagnosed at age 14. Uh, I never intended in my Pilates life to specialize in scoliosis. Um, I ended up dancing with the Radio City Rockettes when I was in my early 20s and ended up getting really injured. Um, so after my first year, I went and started doing Pilates, some rehab Pilates at the Kane School of Corinth Integration in New York City. And uh, that's for the first time where I saw the power of what movement can do for someone that has scoliosis. I saw when you do one-sided exercises, I saw a vertebra physically shift over for the first time. And that was just the first um, time that it even sparked anything in me that maybe I would specialize in scoliosis. But honestly, it didn't even occur to me that, hey, this happened to this person and I have scoliosis as well. And maybe something like that would happen to me. Never even crossed my mind. So I moved to New York, uh, after I moved to New York City, I moved to Nashville, Tennessee, which is where I live now and have my studio. And um, normal Pilates studio, and uh, slowly but surely, word got out that I had scoliosis and I could work with people that had scoliosis, which was news to me because I didn't specialize in it. I didn't really know anything about it. I knew how to stack bodies up, but that was pretty much it. So um, about a year after I opened my first studio, I had a mom come to me with her nine-year-old daughter. And she said, hey, my, my daughter has scoliosis. I'm refusing to have surgery for her. Um, I want you to work with her. I said, mm, okay, let's see what happens. Well, within six months, we were able to decrease her curvature. And that's kind of a medical miracle because in, in the orthopedic world, that just, A, that doesn't happen. In brace it, bracing and in surgery, that's the only way that maybe you can stabilize the curvature. Um, and the mom and dad were like, oh my gosh, this is amazing. We'll do anything for you. Keep working with her. And I said, hmm, well, I actually do want something. I want research. They were both professors at Vanderbilt University. And so they were able to go and have their research assistants get me every piece of research that there was in the world at the time that had the word scoliosis in it. So I got zip file after zip file of hundreds of research articles. And my, my latest book is, um, is that research. Awesome. So then I spent the next, oh golly, I've been a Pilates instructor for like 15 years. So then I spent the next 11, 12 years chewing on it and, and slowly playing with it with this child. And then with all these scoliosis clients that just started pouring into my studio. And then I also started working on them myself. So that's how I ended up in the scoliosis world. I never intended to. Um, so yeah. That's the, that's the short story on that. Well, awesome. So how is, um, like for you, since obviously scoliosis is a personal issue for you. So are you able, obviously you don't look crooked sitting over here, you know, you don't have your shoulder. Yeah, you're not like this and everything. So obviously you were able to stabilize your personal body to the point. Um, I mean, I guess it's not saying that you don't have scoliosis anymore but you are at a position where it's more balanced in your body or how would you describe it? Yeah, so, so A, it's interesting to work with all these clients, young little itty bitty girls to really old women, to people that have come with me with congenital issues, to people who have, who have come with me with fusions, to people that have come with me having broken fusions, to people that have um, Schuermann syndrome. And, and I mean, the list of all the ways that scoliosis manifests itself, leg length discrepancies, Chiari syndrome, um, 
uh, different forms of gen congenital hypermobility congen uh, issues have all ended up at my studio. Um, so uh, having chewed on all of that and all these people coming to me and saying, work with me, no one else will touch me. I'm like, my little soft heart goes, okay, well, I'm going to, I'm going to stand up for the, un, for the, the injustice that's happened for these people that don't have anywhere to go. So I have no idea how to work with you, but let's do this. Combine that with my own body. I had two kids, 21 months apart in a miscarriage, just like three months before I had my first child. So my body went through psycho hormones in about a four year time period. So when I was 14 years old, I was diagnosed with 17 degree curve. I was pretty much ignored. And they said, eh, it's not going to happen. Nothing's ever going to happen. Keep dancing. I was a really intense ballerina at the time. And they said, keep dancing. Not a big deal. Have a good life. I was totally ignored, which was probably the best thing, honestly, at that time, because there was nothing proactive to do. So um, I wrote my first book years ago. So I have it here. It's called The Beautiful Scoliotic Back. And it was just like my, my experiences with my clients, just really broad suggestions for people that have scoliosis and their parents. And I said, you know what? I haven't had an x-ray in so long. I sh people just need to see that. I have it, even though I don't look like I have it. So I went and got an x-ray and my upper curve was at 35 degrees and my lower curve was at 24 degrees. Oh, I was mad because I felt so let down by the medical community. They, I was totally ignored as a child. They said nothing would ever happen to it. And here I am, my curve has, I'm has and, and it's like, and they have nothing to offer me. And, and at that point, I was like, it was, it was this fire that burned within me saying, if this has happened to me, that means there's a really high likelihood that this has happened to the millions upon millions of people around the world that have scoliosis. So at that point, I start diving in. And now it's a personal thing because I had been working on my scoli clients, but it had never, you know, I'm like, I have it, but it's not a big deal. Yeah, I got it. No, oh, yeah, I totally, I'm strong. I can do snake two weeks after I give birth, you know, on the reformer. It's totally not a big deal. But then it became personal. And so I started doing all these different kinds of modalities um, and melding them and realizing that this is not just a pubescent situation. This is something that will affect everyone that has scoliosis, has scoliosis for the rest of their life. This is not, here are three exercises, do them 10 minutes a day and you're going to get fixed. It's, it doesn't work like that. It will never work like that. And I never heard that from anyone in the medical community. I never read that. Um, I, I was told by a doctor once, um, he said, oh, well, you have like a 35 degree curve well, let's just do fusion now because it will get worse by like one to two degrees for the rest of your life. I stood there. I was so mad at him. You go home, you run the math. And I'm like, okay, so by, by the time I'm 80, you're telling me that my curve could be like 120 degrees. The math doesn't, yeah. I'm like, so I'm walking around like this. I'm like, you guys went to school for like eight or 10 years to do what you're saying. And you just said the most absurd thing in the entire world. And so I just started melding all these things together and this fire burned within me to start writing the wrong and actually finding out what this research says and getting it out to people. Awesome. So um, obviously we talked about like, what's your personal experience? So what's your, um, you know, your other book that you mentioned, My Beautiful Scholarly Back, this one's more for general public, right? You mentioned. Yeah, yeah. This is so, just for, yeah, give, so, give it an idea. So when I was at home, I, after I gave birth to my second son, I was at home and I just decided I would write some of these crazy stories that had happened to me from my first Pilates studio. I was at home and I, was, um, I wasn't working a lot right then because I had just sold my first studio and had a newborn at home. I was like, oh, let's just get it up. Super basic, um, uh, barely edited. I just threw it up on the internet, you know, for sale. 
And within uh, that year, if you typed in the word scoliosis on Amazon, that was the book that came up. Wow. And I mean, it was not a well-written book. This one is the second edition, which is like super different. And that opened my eyes to how little information there is to the scoliosis community on mass. So with this book that I wrote first time, I started getting phone calls. I started getting emails from people all around the world, these worried parents saying, I don't know what to do with my child. Will you help me? I'm like, uh, yeah, well, sure. And so this started really me me on my path to to, um, do all this. So that was my first book. Um, And then the second book that I made was called um, My Scully Journal. And this is um, mainly for teenagers to work through the physical and the emotional aspects of having scoliosis. And then people kept asking and asking and asking for, okay, that's super cool. You obviously know how to work with Scully. You're giving this stuff to the general public. We're sold. We want to do Pilates and we want to do massage and we want to do all these other things to help our spines. Okay, how do we do it? And so that's this last book of, um, of analyzing scoliosis and how, how I go about doing it. Because I don't, I don't want to have people from around the world come and see me. There are phenomenal Pilates instructors all around the world. My goal is to empower you so you can help all these people in your town. Because people with scoliosis, their bodies need to be loved on every month, every They need to love on them every day, but every week, probably for the rest of their life, if they want to live a happy, pain-free life. So going and doing a clinic somewhere, going across the world, spending thousands of dollars for like a weekend intensive or something like that, that's all fine and dandy, but then you're going to go home and two weeks later, your spine's going to hurt again. Mm -hmm. And that, that's not the answer to working with people with scoliosis. Yeah, so it's like scoliosis, it requires that ongoing for the rest of your life. It's kind of like brushing your teeth. Totally. Yeah. And it's exercises, maintenance, everything. Exactly. And that's part of the thing that um, it takes a little bit of talking to with the with parents and people that have scoliosis because in our society we're taught that we can get a magic pill or we can have a magic surgery and everything is gonna get fixed. So even if you have the surgery for scoliosis, you still have it. Part of you will be fused, but guess what? Scoliosis is actually, I was reading some fascinating research last week or um, last month that came out in December of 2018 um, that shows that scoliosis, idiopathic scoliosis is probably a neuroinflammatory condition. So, this is something that is systemic that just happens to show itself in a crooked spine. I've also read research that it's a hormonal neurological condition. There are so many things that go into having scoliosis that, okay, you can have surgery, but that doesn't take this underlying condition out of you. So your body will continue to fight against the screws and the rods that have been put in you. And whatever is not fused, into your pelvis, into your shoulder girdle, into your neck, into your head, having TMJ, having a hip that cracks all the time, having a knee that doesn't align very well. It's all part of scoliosis. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, it's an amazing research that you do because that you read, not you do, but uh, because really that is one of the problems with scoliosis because nobody really knows what causes it and what doesn't. Like, um, for example, like I have twin, identical twin girls. One of them has a much stronger scoliotic curve than the other one, and they're identical. Like they're everything, they're built, they're born, like they look the same, everything. But one is different than like her spine is different than the other ones. And you know, like they do the same activities, everything, but there's still difference, and nobody will explain it like why, because they don't know. So you know, I was having so- a fascinating conversation with two of my scoliotic clients. They're probably 50 and 60 yesterday at the studio after teaching them a group class. And uh, we were having this exact same conversation. And I said, actually, there is some fascinating research that can shed light onto this. So um, the, the research that I just uh, mentioned about having it be a neuroinflammatory condition. So this, there was some research that was done on um, zebrafish 
interestingly, that is a good research says is a good model for those of us with idiopathic scoliosis. I have no idea where it goes to zebrafish, but let's just ride the train. And so they, um, this research was fascinating because um, they mutated a gene. Oh, I'm going to say it incorrectly, like PK. T7 or something like that. There are a few genes that can be slightly mutated in us that can be the scoliotic gene. Now, just because we have a gene that's dirty or that's slightly mutated doesn't mean that it's going to show itself. So, so this is where we get into the realm of epigenetics or how our external environment can turn off or turn on certain genes of ours. So, Oftentimes, you'll have a, a myriad of women through a family that have scoliosis. They're like, oh, my mom had scoliosis, so I'm going to have it. But then you don't have it. But then your daughter has it. Mm -hmm. So somehow you were able to pass on that gene to your daughter, but that gene was never turned on for you. So then that gets into the question of, well, what turns genes on? Yeah. And you can have identical twins with the same exact genome pattern, but they are two different people. So one maybe got a tick bite. One maybe got exposed to a few of her toxic chemicals one day. Maybe one has a, a few food allergies that the other doesn't that we don't know about or food sensitivities. And we continue to consume those foods. And so our our um, immune system is just always a little bit higher and a little bit more inflamed than the other person, even though we don't really ever know that. And then all of a sudden we go through a growth spurt and we are required, our body is required a lot more things. Uh, we're required more sleep. We're required perfect nutrition. We're required a myriad of things in order to have a period for our first time or something like that. And because we have these certain stressors that have gone into our system, we just can't, our body just can't handle it. And so it just yeah. happens. So anyways, that'll be a book that'll probably be written in a few years called The Root of Scoliosis. So, <laughs> <laughs> so, so until we know all of this, mm -hmm. We, on the, on the end of being a Pilates instructor, we have to know what do we do in our scope of practice, mm -hmm. because even though there is some research that came out about supplements that can help it, that's technically not within our scope of practice. It's, okay, what do we do when a client comes to our studio? Yeah, so what are our main goals? Yeah, yeah. Right? So, obviously, some people come with us with pain. Obviously, that's going to be easy. It's just get rid of get rid of the pain but then some people it's just some kind of imbalance you know crookedness all the kind of stuff so what what are our goals with a scoliotic uh, yeah. client so so i have a few different things to say on this now so let's let's start first off with the concept of goals so i think it's really important when you have a scoliotic client to have a very open conversation with them about all right what's your goal today how are you feeling? Because oftentimes us as Pilates instructors, you know, we see everything. We're flying up here. We've already got a game plan. We want to fix this. We want to fix this. We want to fix this. And we're flying up here. And our client is flying down here with their goal set. And their goal is, I'm fat. <laughs> My right shoulder's higher. I hate how I look. Yeah. And so, so their goal is, I want to lose weight and I want my self-esteem to be improved. And our goal is, I want to straighten things and do micro work to start unweaving what's going on. So if you give this awesome Pilates lesson where you're just doing tons of rehab and all this stuff and your client didn't sweat, they're going to leave. And so, so it's been interesting that I've, I've had to have these open conversations and I've been shocked. So. I was having a conversation with um, a 17 year old girl's mom one day and I said, and she was feisty that day. I mean, she was like getting in my business. Like when I was working with this girl and it was like, okay, we're dealing with something way more than just like me fixing Scully this day. And so at the end of the conversation, I said, okay, what, what do you want from me? 
and she was like, I, you know, I want my daughter to be strong and all this stuff. I was like, oh, we're not getting there. She's, she's not telling me something. Mm-hmm. And I said, I said, what are you, what do you not like about your daughter's scoliosis? And she said, I hate how it looks. Now, and it was like, bam, it's like, whoa. Yeah. So, so this, this is such a deep emotional issue within this mom of like, the scoliosis makes my daughter look ugly, which is a whole other conversation. You're just like, whoa, we need to go to therapy right now. Yeah. Like we've got some secret professional here. <laughs> exactly. The more I have untwisted my clients' backs, the more tears that have been shed on my scoliotic floor at my studio. You just need to be aware of that as a Pilates instructor because these feelings are so deeply inset in parents and in kids. But the daughter, the daughter of this conversation, she didn't have anything wrong. She didn't care how she looked. She thought she looked beautiful. And so now we have this weird relationship between mom's feelings and daughter's feelings and mom's goals and daughter's goals and my goals. <laughs> so sometimes if it's a child and there's active progression, we need to have a serious conversation with parents and say, okay, what's our goal? Our goal is in the next six months, your curves have been stabilized. In the next six months, we've seen a decrease in your curvature when you have your next x ray, even if it's by four degrees. I don't care. I just don't want an increase. If you're working with a 65 year old person who's overweight and has never exercised a day in their life and has a 65 degree scoliotic curve, if their goal goal is to have a straight spine, you will fail them 100%. And so you need to have these conversations with them. And oftentimes with my scoliotic clients, the conversation is, okay, my, my goal is for you that within six months, you're not going to be in pain or your pain is going to be less or something like that. Having, if your client says, I want a straight spine, you need to have a real serious conversation with them because you will fail them. Not saying that you won't be able to decrease curvature because oftentimes to get less pain, that is untwisting and straightening their spine. But if they expect Um, especially if they're a lot older and have lived in this pattern and don't know anything about their bodies and they want a straight spine, you, you're going to be doing this again. You're going to not be on the same plane, but that brings me to, um, my favorite, uh, let's see my, Oh, we got, this is a, this is an, a scoliometer app that I had made a few years and it turns your phone into a scoliometer. Mm-hmm. This is hands down my favorite tool when it comes to working with scoliotic clients. So with scoliosis, the hard thing is we don't, I need feedback. How do I know that I'm actually helping my scoliosis, uh, my, the client that has scoliosis? So research came out um, a handful of years ago that shows that um, the lateral curvature of degree or your cob angle When I look at an x-ray, how curved is the spine from side to side and vertebral rotation or how much the spine is twisted. So if you look forward and your client bends forward and you see one side sticking up higher, that's the rotation that those numbers, the scoliometer measurement, the rotation and your x-ray or your lateral curvature degree, they are positively correlated. So. If you measure your client's back with a scoliometer before a session, you do your awesome analyzing and your awesome rehab session, and then you measure them at the end, and you just got a decrease in your scoliometer measurement, that also means that you just got a decrease in their x-ray. So I have years, like I have like 12 years of data on some of my clients. And so when they were younger, I could tell them if their x-ray was going to be worse. I could tell them if their x-ray was going to be better. I could tell, I could tell when their period was about to start because their scoliometer measurements got higher. I could tell when finals came around because those scoliometer measurements went higher. And on days 
where even though I've been working them for years on days where I could not get that scoli to decrease the way I wanted to by the end of the scoliometer measurement at the end of the session, I would give them the feedback and say, okay, we have a little bit of a scoli storm going on right now. So we're going to need to get some extra help so the scoli doesn't stay this high. So on those days, and it really depends on the client, it would be uh, structural integration or rolfing or a neuromuscular massage, or it'd be acupuncture. Um, so there would be different things that these different clients of mine would do. And then they'd come back in and I'd say, oh, look, it's back down. And they would, they would feel better. So with any Pilates instructor that works with a scoliotic client, I cannot encourage you enough to start using a scoliometer on your, on your client before and after because they spend a lot of money and a lot of time with you and they trust you implicitly. So especially if it's a client that's younger and like, this is not a time for just like an awesome fun Pilates session, but it's like, yo, we need to stop the scoliometer. Um, we need to stop, stop the x-ray measurements from increase, the Cobb angle measurements from increasing you have to have that scientific feedback on that. Okay. Cool. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, like something like one of the practical examples. I know, like I work with a lot of um, people who come into the studio. Maybe they're not uh, necessarily they're not complaining of scoliosis, but they have some kind of leg discrepancy, and this is pretty common in people. And some of them have it like actually measured. Some of them they just you can tell their foot just doesn't reach that foot bar on the report. <laughs> it just it just won't happen, you know. Uh, so it, with those kind of with those people, what's um, what's the best scenario? Obviously, do we just pat it all the time to bring it to the like that leveling, or do we work a little bit more in different positions to level it out? What's our plan there? Yeah. Okay. So. In the beginning of um, analyzing scoliosis, I, the, I break it down into three parts. So the first part is analyzing scoliosis, the actual analysis of this. So anytime you see any client that has a little bit of a tweak of a, of a side bend, you need to ana analyze them. You need, and I, I go step by step on how to do it, spinal assessment, pelvic assessment, um, scoliometer, you need to have all these pieces of data to figure out is there a leg length discrepancy going on? Is there no leg length discrepancy? And so therefore their scoliosis is stemming from a different place. It's a neuroinflammatory issue. It's a, uh, the list goes on. So if it is a, uh, if it is, a, if it is a leg length discrepancy, um, then as a plot instructor, we can't change bone. We can't change the shape of bone. We can't change the length of bone. And that's the same thing with someone who has congenital scoliosis, where a, a vertebra was shaped more like a triangle instead of a square. With those clients, you can help them, but I can't ever untwist that. And I can't ever make that straighter because I don't have the power within me to change the shape of bone. Mm -hmm. So for a, for a leg length discrepancy client, it is imperative that you understand um, if there is a true leg length discrepancy. So some clients are like, oh, my hip sticks out and it's higher. I'm like, okay, it, before we start dealing with this, have you had an x-ray where it goes down to the femoral heads? So you can see if actually one femur is sitting higher because if it's a femur sitting higher, then you're going to have to pad that leg for the rest of your life. You're going to have to extend one of those foot straps a little bit longer for the rest of your life. It's just what is. But oftentimes it is one hip that is the like QL and all that fascia is pulling that hip up higher from a deep lumbar curve. I was doing a, a virtual lesson with a client in um, uh, Prince Edward Island in Canada. And yeah, I know, totally random. So I, I do lessons like this with clients sometimes. And, um, she said, Oh, I've got one leg that's longer than any other. And this is by email before we started. And I was like, okay, because I can't put my hands on you. I need you to get an x-ray. I don't, I don't even trust like at this particular situation. Cause she had a lot of pain. I was like, I don't even trust a physical therapist. Just like guessing if one leg's longer than the other. I was like, I need an x-ray. She came back like a month later and we had a session and she said, so 
my x-rays show that I don't have a leg length discrepancy. And I was like, that would have been horrible in that situation if we had padded one leg. I, we would have been making another problem in the body. So if there is a leg length discrepancy, I want to actually know by an x-ray if there is truly a leg length discrepancy. And if there is, then you can pad and they can have a, sh a full shoe insert lift and stuff like that. And you can go at that way. But, and, and with my years of working with scoliosis clients, I, I have been amazed at how many weird ways scoliosis has presented itself. You know, it's a leg length discrepancy, but then we have degenerative scoliosis and, or we have no leg length discrepancy and what it looks like it. And I, I wish that I could say, hey, here's a perfect pattern. Every scoli client's the same. Do these four exercises and you're going to be fixed. It just doesn't happen that way. And I think that people in the scoliosis world that teach that, that it is a massive disservice to those that have scoliosis and the practitioners, because that's not, that's not helping them. That's not helping them live the highest quality life possible. So hence what I named the book, Analyzing Scoliosis. My, through my years, that is what I believe um, correctly working with scoliosis rests upon. Actually correctly understanding how to analyze a scoli body in front of you. Knowing where to place pads. And you can, and I go step by step on how to do this. But you, if you don't do that correctly, um, you're client probably won't feel better. They probably won't live the highest life possible. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, like, obviously it's kind of hard to tell if there's something that you would recommend any other than reading your books, any person yeah. working with scoliotic, uh, you know, clients or any person with scoliosis, what is it like one or two things that they should do? You think just first thing. Yeah. Okay. So, so the second section of this book, I call it scoliosis movement principles. So through me reading up mounds and mounds of research, I came across a pretty blanket statement. Um, uh, I think it might be seven. I have them in here real quick and I'll show them. I'll read them real quick. Um, blanket statements that research says that people with scoliosis just need, and these things by themselves help scoliosis. So one is um, increasing proprioception. So um, there was some fascinating research, I think it was a year ago that came out from Israel showing that, again, we go back to genes, there is um, a, a genetic factor that goes into not understanding where we are in space. So they mutated uh, a few different genes in, in, on these animals uh, in, in Israel when they were doing this test and these, and these animals developed scoliosis. And the goal of this was like, with this research was like learning how to set bones and reset bones. They didn't figure that out, but they figured out that proprioception and this genetic piece heavily influences those people that have scoliosis. So you as a scoli teacher or um, Pilates instructor um, could cue your client until you are blue in the face and your scoli client will literally have no idea on what you're trying to have them do and therefore cannot manifest that within their body and research shows that possibly genetically they cannot do that so there's so many different ways have them push something have them pull something never have a limb out in space because they don't know where it is in space um always have them have them on something have them pat it touch it massage parts of their back um, use, I use my phone all the time in class. I'll have, I'll take a video of them doing something in their back and say, look at this. Do you see this part of your back? I need this to come out there. Like, oh, wow. I had no idea. Okay. Let me try it again. Or I'll take pictures of their back and show them. And immediately they get this different sense of where they are in space because they don't have that piece. Um, find length. Gravity is not our friend on earth. The minute we wake up, gravity starts to win. If someone who has scoli or someone that doesn't have scoli, we just kind of compress. Someone that does have scoli, we do this throughout the day. Mm -hmm. So tractioning, 
Get them to defy gravity. As flight instructors, we have lots of ways to traction. Have them traction in the beginning and the end in between hard strengthening exercises to continue to defy gravity. Breathe and derotate. So once you analyze things and figure out what is the concave part of the back of their back, they have to learn how to breathe posteriorly into that. If they can do that, that's going to be the first part of them learning how to derotate. Um, mobilize the spine. So a few years ago, I was reading some research about spinal fusion, and there was an interesting part that was talking about in what they had to do, what surgeons had to do in order to straighten the spine. And they said we have to. They cut different ligaments along the spine to mobilize the spine in order to make it straight. I actually still think I have this research. I had some colored pencils there and I was like scribbling all over this paper. I was like, you do not have to cut ligaments to mobilize the spine. As Pilates instructors, we know so many ways to mobilize the spine that does not involve a knife. So in the beginning of all of my sessions, depending on the person and how much mobility they need, we're going to spend at least the first 10 minutes of every Scully session just mobilizing the spine in a myriad of different ways. I'm a gyrotonic instructor, and it's my, fa my favorite way is just get them on the gyrotonic tower, do some handle unit work, and it's, I can efficiently really get that done. But those who are not gyrotonic instructors, um, hello, how many millions of ways are there to do that on all the Pilates equipment or even that? Um, reinstate plumb lines. So as Pilates instructors, we can stack a client up. You have to be able to stack a client up. You need to look at all angles, front, side, both sides, right side and left side are probably going to be really different. So um, when I first worked with my nine-year-old client that had Scoli, I didn't, I didn't know any of this, but I did know how to put straight lines into a scoliotic body. That enough, that was enough to get decrease in curvature. So Stack the body up. If you see something out, don't let the client continue. If they can't hold something when they're doing a plank or anything like that, they're not strong enough to derotate and hold that in that position. So they don't get to do that exercise today. We do a, a, a lesser exercise of that. Um, and then the last one is work the core. Across the board, across the board, people, um, uh, uh, whether, whether, these, this re, these researchers were way into exercise or not, everyone acknowledges that people that have scoliosis have weak cores, they have weak pelvic floors, they have weak transversus, they have uneven multifidus muscles. Get the multifidus muscles even. If you have a lumbar curve and the convex muscles are really overworked, and the concave muscles are sleeping because the lumbar multifidus is part of the core, if you do not have even right and left multifidus muscles, you don't have a functioning core. So as Pilates instructors, that's really low hanging fruit. Work the core, get them into straight lines. And even if it takes you a long time to like get through the book to understand everything, if you can do these seven, I think that was seven things, you, you literally just those alone over the next six to nine months when you work with a Scully client, you could get some serious decreases in curvature and pain just with that. And you obviously go into more of the practical applications of how to get all this done in your book. Right? Yeah. yeah. Awesome. Yeah. So, so yeah, uh, go for so it. Finish up. So, and one of the things that, um, that is interesting uh, going back to the goal thing was, um, a lot of Pilates instructors, when we see clients that have scoli, you know, our brain just starts exploding with all the things that we see wrong. And then what the client is complaining of where their pain is does not match up with what we're seeing. We're like, oh my gosh, right rotator cuff, left external hip rotators, you know, lumbar multifidus is rotated and all these things, but that's not what they're saying. And oftentimes I see in Pilates instructors, they don't know where to start. They don't know. They're like, oh my gosh, what do I, what do I do? And, and where there's so many things we get overwhelmed. Mm -hmm. So you can start with those movement principles, but long-term to get them out of pain, all the secondary issues that we see 
We get the right shoulder that's rotated forward. We get the right rib cage that's rotated back in space. We get uh, right hip, right psoas that's super tight, that's pulling everything forward in the right hip joint usually. Um, we see all these things, but you have to understand all these secondary things, they are secondary to the spine. Mm -hmm. So you can fix, you can fix the shoulder, you can fix the hip, but every time that client comes back in, they're going to come back with the same exact thing because that's a secondary issue. That's not the primary issue. The primary issue is what's happening in the spine because where do the arms hang off the body? The arms hang off the body right here at the sternoclavicular joint, which is right on the sternum. The sternum is the front of the spine. It's the front of the circle. So the arm, if we have anything wrong with the arm, high likelihood in a scoliotic client is hap what's happening. The issue is in the thoracic spine and the legs hang off the acetabulum in the pelvis. What's the back of the pelvis? It's the bottom of the spine. So, so anything that's happening, literally, this is a blanket statement. It's not always the case, but I'm going to make this blanket statement anyways. In someone that has scoliosis, be it a little curve or a big curve, almost any secondary issue that happens is because of their scoliosis. So you have to learn how to stack up the scoli and untwist the scoli. And then you can go at, I call it finding your client's recipe, which is the last part of the book. Because sometimes you can do all that stuff, stack everything up, but there's still like a few tweaking things that just won't go away. And then I go through like different muscle testing and things on finding where that scoli manifested itself in the right hip joint, in the left shoulder joint or something like that. And then you can do a few different things to test and find out where these things are. But as a Pilates instructor, I just need you to understand that when scoli happens, don't get bogged down with seeing all the random little things and trying to fix those things. Keep your eye on the prize, which is straightening and untwisting the scoli itself. Yeah. Yeah, I, I totally agree. Like, again, like spine is the first and thank you for sharing that. And then, you know, little things like if a person lived with their scoliosis for 10, 20, 50 years, obviously there might be some muscle things going on, like in like those rotator cuffs or whatever it is, and they might need a different, maybe, like you said, neuromuscular massage, some trigger point release or something like that done that would just let yeah. those muscles fire again or release yeah. them or just, you know, get them out of that um, constant on contraction mode. Mm -hmm. um, thank you so much, Erin, for this interview. Oh, I think no, awesome with all the information that you shared and um i hope that everybody who watches this interview they'll go ahead and purchase the your book or several of your books uh i think um you know your book is available on amazon right is it available in bookstores or just amazon is it right yeah, amazon. everything's online yep e everything's online and i know you also have several um of your workshops on a fusion um fusion pilates Asheville edu i know jennifer johnny so she has a great resource over there so they want to see you in action on video that's probably going to be the best place to head over there are there any other like learning mentoring opportunities yeah yeah so i teach scoliosis workshops around the world i'm at pilates on tour this year i'm going to korea this year i'll be in florida in about a month so i have that i've got scoliosis workshops at my studio um I'm about to shoot a bunch of videos with Balanced Body for those that actually have scoliosis to do scoliosis workouts at home. Mm -hmm. I have I have one of those videos already on Amazon. So yeah, my goal is on all aspects for Pilates instructors, for parents, for those that have scoli, for doctors, that there are resources that you can have and all of it's available on spiralspine.com. Awesome. Well, thank you so much. I'll link to everything uh, that we talked about underneath and just all your resources. And I hope if anybody has any questions, they can leave them in the comments below or reach out to Erin directly. And um, I'll share again, like all the ways to contact you over there. Thank you so much. Thanks.